Hello and welcome to another Office 365 Hours. My name is Christian Buckley. I'm the Microsoft Go-To-Market Director at AvPoint and an Office Apps and Services MVP and Regional Director. And I'm joined today by Lorian Strand. Hey, Lorian, how's it going? Uh, really he's a fellow, a fellow Office Apps and Services MVP, co-founder and contributor to the Regarding 365 community and podcast, uh, and an independent consultant with Strand Consulting based in Melbourne, uh, uh, Australia. So good morning to you, sir. Good morning. I probably should update my profile a bit. I'm actually a product manager at InSync as well. Oh, that's right. You are. Well, you, so you're a multifaceted individual. You're doing a lot that's out there, staying busy. So yeah. That's right. Well, today we're discussing an interesting topic, and it's actually something that's come up uh, quite a bit in the last few weeks. In fact, I've heard the question from people around security and governance around the Power Platform. So that's what we're going to talk about, the need for governance around the Power Platform. So let's kind of kick things off. So, uh, Lorian, what is the role of the citizen developer in the modern you know, information worker sphere? Well, this is a contentious one that I think we'll talk a bit more about, but the, the citizen developer, uh, I think, is kind of the, the way I see it is they're a maverick. They're a person who is going off and building their own apps and workflows and solutions um, outside of what the, the organization normally would do. Um, and I'm not saying that's a negative thing. I'm just saying that the when you think about citizen developer, it's a commoner, a lay person, an end user, uh, whatever terminology we want to use, um, whether derogatory or not, who has gotten into some of the Power Platform and is building their own things. That's So what's their role? Their role is an unofficial appointed one where they are just trying to make things better because they don't want to wait for IT to necessarily come around and do it. That's my take on it. That's like a lot of the history there. I mean, no, nothing. It's not like this is a new thing. This is right. you know, it's been around for a long time, and and certainly, I mean, you and I both, you know, come up through the uh, the SharePoint ranks, and you know, in in that world, you had people a lot of shadow IT efforts, but a lot of it was that they would go to IT, put in a, a request, I need this new feature, I need this capability, or I saw this really interesting looking third party solution that seems like it will solve the business needs, the gaps in the current offerings that we have there. And then IT says, all right, either they don't respond to it or to the request, or they say, hey, we, we don't have the, the the head count to be able to go and address this now. We'll look at it over the next few weeks or whatever it is. And the individual says, I know enough to go mm. and, and to do it myself. And so they kind of behind the scenes go, scenes go and, and build that. And SharePoint, yeah. I mean, changed and evolved to meet the needs of this class of power user, or whatever you wanted to call it, these class of users that were going and trying to solve their own problems. That's kind of where the idea for sandbox solutions back in the day, you know, came from to to yeah, make it, was, it to protect the environment from some of these activities. Absolutely, we don't even have to look at even though SharePoint has been around for twenty years. It's not even SharePoint necessarily that has a, a brought a lot of it to light in from, from the Microsoft sphere, because even things like access, you know, the amount of organizations where somebody built an access database that becomes a production system, that is the old version of Power Apps effectively, um, you know, and Dataverse. They're building their own databases. They're building their own forms and front ends. They're building their own actions and workflows. Um, all those people who would go and build systems in Excel, you know, because someone like myself who can basically just use some and concatenate and a few other things, that's about it. Um, other can people go into Excel. Word, and they, or can you actually concatenate data together? I can do it. I have to right. sometimes look up how to do it again, but I remember I'm okay with it. Um, but these people like, you know, I've opened spreadsheets that have got multiple tabs and, you know, different layouts on the screen and they've got interactive buttons and pop-ups. All those people that have gone into Word and built macros and those kind of things. We've had citizen developers for a long, long time. They're just people who've gone, I want to do it better. How can I do it better using the tools that I've got? Um, so, yeah, it is shadow IT, but it's also end users just trying to use the tools that they've got. Yeah, and, and it's um, part of it, too, is that I think we saw this increasingly, again, 
from a SharePoint example, but of building these solutions and then the limitations to be able to share those solutions between uh, between uh, uh, team sites or between uh, environments um, mm. to build something. You know, part of the problem was you know deploying those solutions, and and so you had, of course, there's plenty of ISVs that started by. You know, it was an idea that was built for a customer or a, a, a company built it. And then some enterprising uh, person said, hey, this is a product that we can spin out that other people can can go and use. But it wasn't really how you package that it was a whole nother effort to take what you built in, in a good way and then to be able to share that elsewhere within the environment. Well, Power Platform was kind of set up to, I guess, Power Platform empowers, you know, users to go and, but end to end, build these solutions and then um, and share those out and be able to to make it more transportable uh, in between. Well, and, and and maybe instead of calling them citizen developers, because I think that terminology doesn't really translate like to that end user. I don't I don't think they see themselves as I'm a citizen developer because to those people, developers are probably you know. You know the, the that stereotype of people who sit in the dark room and don't have social skills. You know, which we know is not the case. But there's a stereotype with it. And saying, "Hey, you're a citizen developer," is like, how rude of you. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you're, I think that that's why I'm not a particular fan of that term. Um, but perhaps, especially when we're talking about power platform, we should call them powered individuals or powered people, much like we do in the superhero movies, where people have powers and they do things. Not always for the best reasons, like. You know, shows like The Boys and those kind of things. Um, uh, but that's the thing is, so they're powered individuals. And that works well in the, t in the pun that they can use power platform. Well, kind of leading to the governance discussion, because because part of, I know some of the early on concerns were, you know, people going and building workflows, um, and yep. which, you know, moved into power automate or building some of these solutions. But a lot of the, the, the questions were, okay, well, what kind of, rigor do we put around these solutions will it truly scale if we have somebody go and build that if you know it that in theory should go through and has more of a methodology to build things but what methodology is in place and are we regularly reviewing the solutions that are being built like it's great that it works for your need but will it scale you know, as the use of the solution grows and and so and then and then also was it built the most efficient way is it something that does require it like i get what you did that fixes that spot solution but what we really need and to build something grander so that's the question is is more organizations embrace this citizen developer mindset empowering users to go and and solve their own problems to some level whatever that level is what are some of the concerns around governance you know in in broad terms around power platform well, I think it's a, an interesting one. I think if we take a step back for a sec, you, if we look at how applications come to be in organizations, some applications will come from a request to IT to go and source something. But a lot of times, line of business applications actually come into IT for effectively like final validation, security, um, those kind of things, because it's not IT's job to go out and select a HR system, a finance system, um, you know, if you think about an organization when they get Dynamics in, IT doesn't go with Dynamics or with Salesforce. No, they get the stakeholders in who are going to make the decision, and IT is, you know, a key part of it. So similar thing with Power Apps is it's not up to, um, you know, the average end user to say, hey, service desk, can someone build me an app or a workflow or a dashboard to do this? That's how we end up with citizen developers because it's usually their responsibility to, look at how they can address their needs, improve their business. Um, but then that's where they do need to involve IT from a governance perspective, um, because governance is not about can you do it, can't you do it, it's not just yes, no, black, white. It's about how do you do it you know, in a scalable way, in a secure way. So are you using a third-party connector to achieve this workflow? Is the data leaving our organisation? Um, from a scalability perspective, are you using a SharePoint list in you know your OneDrive or in just a site that nobody has access to, um, you know, is it, are you documenting this so that when you leave um, or if you change roles, 
that somebody knows. And I've got, I've got this with customers all the time where they come to me and say, hey, can you, you know, uh, get one of your team to modify this app? It's like, well, sorry, we have to do a discovery piece on the app because I don't want to just go in and start changing things. Yeah, I don't know your right. app. Yeah, you, you want to understand what it is. And, and plus, a lot of those, they're in production, they're being used, and you want to do something to uh, to, to stop that or, or alter that, especially now as a consultant to come in and work with the well, client. Yeah, and I think also there's um, the other, there's a, the, the thing is it's not a simple answer and there's not a simple solution or a simple challenge to it because even something um, like scalability, for example, or somebody creating an app or a workflow is if there's not a community around it and a support structure, then people don't know that somebody else is doing something. So multiple people might be developing apps or workflows in parallel or somebody tried something, you know, started to hit their head against the wall, gave up on it, but got maybe 60% of the way there. Yeah, you're starting from the ground. Um, so maybe, you know, if you knew about this stuff, and that's, I think, the challenge with a lot of this citizen developer type stuff is it's it's in isolation. It's siloed. Um, we talk about adoption of teams. Like, well, no, we need adoption of Power Platform. We need a community around Power Platform more than any other app, I think. Well, you know, and I think you've just hit on it, the community aspect of that. Where I've seen in organizations that have done the governance activity right. It's it is. It's a it's a panel of stakeholders, and there's a process. You try to make it as lightweight as possible. You don't want to create bureaucracy for the sake of bureaucracy, but you have a process where anybody can go in. For as an example, anyone can go and build these various solutions, but that there is a review process for these things, and it could be that they're in use, but they're still at some stage reviewed so that you have. Um, IT has questions that they ask about that. Understand that you might have your uh, your, your your data people that uh, uh, that you want to know. Hey, for the scalability of this, and other people that are interested in the solution there. Um, also, you want to classify and tag to capture information around the solution, so that people can have that discovery uh, experience. To like, hey, I'm having this issue. Before I spend any time going and building something, has somebody already built this? And yeah. how did they build it? And will it meet those expanded needs? So part of the discussion then becomes, hey, this department, like somebody over in marketing built this. Now we want to use it over in operations, but we also need these other things. Do we, can we modify that? Is it central? Is it, you know, you know individual to those business units? I mean, so you have all those kinds of questions that you ask. At the end of it, you know, then you have an, an like an authorized registered solution that's that's been through that that rigor it's almost like like if you're going to go and work with like the microsoft store i mean there's a an approval process for apps yeah, yeah. it may have been you know built by the most brilliant uh architects whatever the solution is it still goes through that process where they review it they make sure that it was safe that it meets certain guardrails or guidelines and then they put their stamp of approval on it and then you go well, and I think if we use this term citizen developer, then we need to treat it like we would development. So there needs to be supportability. There needs to be version control. There needs to be uh, reviews. There needs to be, you know, documentation about it. There needs to be, you know, testing. Because one of the challenges that can occur is someone can develop a workflow that can result in a mail storm um, or by corrupting data or those kind of things. Um, a really simple scenario I had recently was um, a, a client had had a um, an app that someone had built that had a SharePoint list behind it that was hitting the 2,000 max limit in Power Apps and how it was displaying. Um, so, okay, cool, we could go in and change the app or a simple solution would be just create like an archive list and then dump everything. But when the workflow was created, they copied everything, but a core piece of metadata was missing, which was who created the original item and when was it created. So, you know, because that wasn't thought of, that was luckily like, you know, we picked it up and went, uh, hey, you've missed this bit. Let's actually go back and roll everything back. Let's undelete everything from the cycle bin and delete everything in the archive and then add those two columns, change the workflow and run it again. Um, but that's because the citizen developer had already gone and done something. Whereas if we actually thought bigger picture and also did a few records and tested, went, oh, oh, we've missed it on a couple. 
let's roll a couple back and they'll do it. Um, and I think that's the problem is that in the development world, we generally have a, and I wouldn't say governance, but we have a framework for how development is achieved, right. good development, that citizen developers don't have that because that's not their, their job. Um, chances are they already have a framework for things like business cases, but they just need to then go, well, I should take that kind of same approach and apply it. And I think that whole governance thing is a, a really good example where unfortunately the products kind of work against us in some instances where a really good example is these, um, uh, what is it, profile plus and boards and bulletins and milestones, these power apps that Microsoft has released for Teams, um, is if you go, cool, let's do good power platform governance, we're going to restrict who can create an environment. Cool, user goes and installs that app, congratulations, you have a dataverse environment for Teams because you can't stop those. So how do we stop that? Well, we can do, you know, other things like maybe not just have um, apps automatically get published um, in the, you know, Teams app store. So then it's not about how platform governance, that's now about Teams governance. Um, and so that's where the, when we look at governance, it can't just be Teams governance, which is usually, to be quite frank, outside of the app point world, Teams governance is provisioning. It's pretty much it, right. to be honest about it. Um, but, um, you know, it needs to be the whole M365 governance aspect when we look at that. And for, for example, again, like if we look at all the little minutia of it, um, in Teams, we have the, um, uh, we've got the Power Automate app, we've got the Power Apps app, uh, we've got the Power Virtual Agents app. Those apps allow you to create. So if we're driving everyone to use Teams, 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 then maybe instead of giving them the Power Apps app in Teams, which will invite them to create an app, instead maybe we give them the shared Power Apps app, which allows them to use Power Apps in Teams, but not create. Now they can always find their way to make.powerapps.com or create.powerapps.com, but um, if that's the front end experience, then that's how we guide them to things. Um, but again, this is where we need that whole governance model to then say, oh, okay, somebody created an app. Let's capture that. Let's detect that we've done that and not go over and scold them and go, hey, don't create an app or a workflow. Hey, we see you've done this. Are you aware there's a community you can work with? What support do you need? Um, what maybe, guidance can we give you? Have you checked with other people if they've done similar? Maybe, so, maybe yeah. you even, uh, you know, and I know that you have kind of like a front door process, whereas you identify that, hey, people have gone out and built some things. You're not stopping them from doing that. That's actually another point I, I want to, you know, ask you yeah. about. But but if you have some some process where it's almost like a, you know, a certification or a, you know, approval to be someone who is authorized to go in and and create you can find the people that self-appoint like i'm going to go solve this problem i'm going to go and build this and as an organization you might rather than stopping people like saying no to this that you instead say hey well that's great but before we you know for for anything for this to go live like we need you to go through and do this basic training to walk through of whatever our methodology is our review process and and complete that activity and then have at it and then you'll yeah, be aware absolutely. of like the steps that around that. Well, this is kind of going to my ne my next question. My my last question around this is is around you know how much governance is too much governance around uh, the power platform because this is that's the issue. If you're putting up barriers around to do something, a couple things happen. Uh, people are like uh, water rolling down a hill. You put a rock in front of them and they go right around that. They're gonna go get their work done. They're gonna, they, they know what they need to, to accomplish. And if you're gonna step in their way and not help them to solve their business needs and guide them on that process, they're gonna go find another way around you. That's what where shadow IT comes from. So what's the right level of, what's the minimal amount of, of, of governance that you need to put around Power Platform? Well, I think a way to look at it, the way I, th I like to think about governance is not so much um, barriers as in prevention. Because a lot of times when we hear the term barrier or controls, it's about prevention, it's on or off. But it's more about, I think, guiding. Think about a supermarket, right? The supermarket has a way you enter and a way you exit, right? And even the exit has choices. You can either go to the, you know, um, 
uh, the, the normal checkout, you can go to the express checkout, you can go to the self-service checkout. You know, the entrance, maybe there's one or two different entrances. Um, and when you get to the entrance, you can pick a different shopping cart tr you know, style or a basket, or there's two different basket types. And then you've got the aisles and the aisles are laid out, but you can go either, you know, go through every different aisle sequentially, um, or you can just go, I've got my list, I'm going to go back and forth. But that's the thing is the supermarket gives us effectively controlled chaos. So that's my approach to governance is controlled chaos. Because if you either go too much control, then the chaos is going to be outside of your realm and that's going to be pure shadow IT and good luck finding it. Um, it's like when people, you know, you survey monkey, you have no idea what data is being collected because you don't have access to it um, or Dropbox or those kind of things. Whereas if we have, you know, um, if we go the opposite way and just let people do whatever we want, then we have no visibility. So this is where good governance is not so much about dictation of people, what people can and can't do. It's about providing them with a framework and some guidance um, and if you think about it, you know, different supermarkets are different, but, you know, some supermarkets will have an app. So if I don't know where to find something, I will look on the app and it'll go, oh, it's in this aisle. Cool. Off I go. Um, or there's, you know, at the end of the aisle, there's like a card that says, you know, um, barbecue things in this aisle. So that's the thing is I've got some guidance to go through. And there's also then staff that I can ask. Um, or, you know, if, if you're out for asking strangers, um, sometimes when I'm having to purchase, you know, certain products for my wife or daughters that I'm not too au fait with, I might ask a female in the same aisle, and usually they're quite helpful. Um, so that's that's the community aspect of things. So the staff being there is kind of like the IT. The other shoppers are like the community. And I think if we provide that kind of framework around the citizen developers, then they're not they're going to have the freedom to explore and experiment, but still within certain constraints and within certain boundaries. Um, and yeah, sure, you know, turn off certain connectors, um, put certain rules down, say, look, you shouldn't do this. Um, but it also should be guidance around things like, hey, before going and building an app, check if an off-the-shelf solution exists, because maybe it's actually a better um, use of time and money to purchase an off-the-shelf solution or a subscription service, whatever it might be, um, or someone's already built an app and just get that in and use that instead of you going off and doing your own thing. So that is, to me is what governance is. It's not controls. It's not just yes, no, you cannot, can't do this. It's about all of these things working together and also providing people with a place to go to ask questions like the service desk and the supermarket. I'm really just working this analogy to the, Really to the bone. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, just and to having a place where they can get support, even if you don't officially support Power Platform, which is completely legitimate because maybe you're not ready, but having a way that they can get some form of support instead of just being told to go fend for themselves. Right. And being responsive. Uh, yeah. And being responsive. Exactly. Uh, you have a formal, I, I always refer to it old school this way as that front door process. So people know where to go. Hey, this is what I'm trying to do. And they may then get guided. So I'm going and building themselves uh, or directed towards something that already exists or, Hey, that may, you know, so it's, it's not saying no, it's not just a pushback and we don't have time to do that, but there's a process for that. And they have visibility in that process. I always like to say that when people have visibility in, if you're transparent about what that process is and the steps to move that forward, if people understand that there's that process that's in place, they're more likely to follow that process. If it's a black box, they'll people reject that. It's uh, they'll push back against the matrix, and uh, and they'll go and do it their own way. Uh, but the other thing, I just to add what you said, because I think that you did cover you know so much of it, is that also the governance process is an iterative process. So you'll yes. learn about like the patterns of behavior of your users as they go and create this. And you may find that, you know, we're consistently running into security issues. Well, then we might, might need to strengthen our review on the security side of things. Or we're, we're increasingly where you know, things are not scaling, whatever it is. And maybe it needs to be that part of your authorized citizen developers um, are, are there's a little more rigor around the training that you provide as people self-select to go and build these things. Um, but that's something that you learn over time. 
You, you can't learn if you're not moving forward. If you're not allowing people mm -hmm. to go and build and trying that out, you won't learn what you need to do better. So um, just it's an incremental process and be reflective on that process and and uh, be open with everybody that's in the system uh, that, hey, we're learning. We're going to move forward with these. This is what we're doing to start with. Work with us on it. Provide us feedback of the experience and we'll pr improve the overall experience. And I think on that point is is this mindset that needs to change from IT is you're absolutely right iterative and I think a lot of them are starting to get it but this mindset that I that end users are dumb and don't know what they're doing well they're not dumb they don't know what you know but you know what you don't know what they know so they're actually really good at their job generally that's why they're doing it so if they are trying to find a better way to do their job using the technology that's available to them, let's embrace that and work with them instead of trying to shut it down. That's, I think, the approach that, that's, I think, this this iteration that's not, it's just not connecting. I'm not seeing it in organisations I talk to. Um, what I keep hearing from them is, is, and not all of them, is that, you know, end users don't know what they're doing. They've just got their thing. They do their jobs. Like, eh, let, let's give them a bit more credit. You know, they're not just, you know, dumb ants who just work in a single line and carry things because even ants are really smart. So, you know, let's actually give them the benefit of the doubt and go, well, we're here to support them. We're here to embrace them and, and help them do their job. So let's not shut them down and, you know, cut them off of the knees, whatever analogy we want. Um, let's change that iterative approach to go, well, what are you doing today? How are you, you know, what can, what problems can we solve? Um, what have you learned? What have you found yourself? Um, because even like a really basic workflow that just takes something from an email and puts it into a planner is not exactly going to be revolutionary, but you know what? can make a huge difference to everybody in the organization potentially. So let's support that and let's let that grow. Right. And, and, then, so far. and, it, and, and right. And, that, and the most of what we've talked about too has nothing less to do with the technology, the governance aspect. It's the people side of that having yeah. conversations around understanding what they're doing, why they're doing that, um, and uh, and then having conversations around that. And that's, uh, you know, organizations that are able to, that are set up and have these, uh, you know, have a culture of uh, around change management and the ability to go in there and and have an open dialogue about what we're trying to accomplish and, and, and pull from any corner of the business for expertise around that thing are the ones that are going to be uh, able to move much more quickly and change as the business needs change. So it's Absolutely. very important. So, well, Lorian, really appreciate your time today. It's an, it's a, it's a solid topic. There's a lot we can go into uh, in detail, even what we've already covered, but uh, really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me on. It was, uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity to get on a fresh soapbox. All right. We'll see you soon. And thanks, everybody, for watching.